Hi, everyone. And if you're listening, you survived Tesla's uh, post-earning price action here on the 20th of July, 2023. As you can see on the screen, unfortunately, Tesla's down uh, quite a considerable amount, 9.74%, and that is $28.36 per share, closing at $262.90. And as you probably know, um, we saw a recent high yesterday of around $299.20. Um, so, so peak to draw, if that's that's $37 um, over the course of uh, a little over a day's time. And of course, that is because of the reaction um, to the earnings and the uh, the comments made by, by Elon uh, during the their earnings call itself. Now, before we dive into price action and, and looking at the rest of the market to understand um, why things are why they are, uh, one of the components to, to the price action would be just some just some news, but we'll start off with uh, Gene Munster over at Deepwater Asset Management. He appears on CNBC a lot, and he follows tech stocks, including uh, uh, including Tesla. And he had some comments last night before the stock proceeded to sell off another uh, five and three quarters of a percent. He went on to say Tesla's June quarter results were solid as expected. Shares of Tesla traded down by four percent off management's comments that implied gross auto margin. Um, will be down slightly in September due to production downtime for retooling and other investments. The hyper-focus on near-term margins overlooks the long-term value of the company is creating by aggressively investing in new models, production capacity, batteries, and FSD, all of which will lead to increasing margins over time. So Gene is pretty bullish as far as the long-term prospects of, of Tesla. That's kind of one of those things. It's like if you look at Tesla's price action over the course of the last couple of years, it is incredibly volatile. And I understand now we're still kind of in a long two-year downtrend for Tesla, but you're going to get really high peaks and you can get really low lows. And it's, it's just the nature of the beast when it comes to, to Tesla. So after you see some considerable moves, um, like we mentioned many weeks ago, before about a month before earnings, is that all you can really do over the course of that time is use the assets that you have to generate income for yourself. Um, I know selling calls hurt a lot of people during the run-up in the spring, I'm sorry, into the early summer, um, but it really uh, is not timed very well in that case. What you're looking for is the move to kind of finish. And how do you know when the move is finished? Well, I think you can really just use exhaustion when it comes to things like RSI, stochastic RSI, or the MACD indicators on your trading view charts. Um, or when something moves 82% in like two weeks, um, maybe then it is done. And you can say to yourself, well, Mark, 20% is a lot. It moved 20% in three days, four days. What do I do then? Well, we talked about strategies on how to sell calls and protect your upside with hedges as long as you can identify you're in an uptrend. Um, and then when you realize the move is maybe about done, start to understand that the range that Tesla will trade in would be anywhere from 15 to 25%. And those swings are very, very large, yes. Um, but at the same time, they always are preceding some type of event. And you can always try to sell calls uh, expiring at the event's time or sell calls um, maybe two weeks out and have upside hedges one week out, some, some stuff like that, basically a calendar spread. So some um, so let's go back to Deepwater Assets Management's uh, takeaways here. As auto gross margins drift lower, investors wonder when and by how much they will improve. So let's address this concern because this is the concern that people like you and me have, and also analysts on Wall Street, this is the biggest issue they have with Tesla, is that their, their extreme um, discounting uh, since the beginning of this year has put into uh, a gray area their gross margin. And looking for clarity during the earnings call, when the questions are asked, or, um, you know, Elon says, you know, basically, you know, it, it's very possible that uh, our future investments in the company and uh, any possible um, need to move product uh, could affect the overall margin. He didn't give uh, a, a, what everyone was wanting to hear in understanding that the margins have bottomed. And from now on, the uh, margins could now go up because he doesn't feel the need to discount to move product, let's say, or that um, we didn't understand the type of investments that he's putting into the company. But I think th these investments are actually worthwhile. They're, they're factories, they're service centers, they're distribution warehouses, they're, um, they're uh, of course, making superchargers. And the most important is developing and retooling 
uh, for their new products. The Cybertruck is tooling up right now. Um, they're modifying the production lines for Model 3 and Model Y in, in their respective factories. And they are developing the next generation, uh, quote unquote, robo-taxi. So Elon had a great comment. He, he said he was surprised they had a billion in free cash flow already. Um, for this past quarter, because of all the things we're spending money on, he was very surprised they had this positive free cash flow. And that might sound a bit, you know, facetious, but the reality is, you know, the street was expecting over $2 billion in free cash flow. But knowing what he's doing and knowing what, even like, for instance, the the, the, re- the requirement for more compute for their, their AI and their server farm, um, th- that's going to be another billion dollar spend over the next year that... Having the free cash flow while making these big investments by talking to other countries, knowing that you have to set aside money for a new factory, sitting on $23 billion in cash, putting out almost a billion dollars in free cash flow, that's a, that's a power move, I think. But the street wouldn't really care about that because, you know, they, and he asks why. So why, why, why does the street sell and why don't they appreciate what you and I might appreciate? Well, they see it very simple. Like, I mean, if you look at a, uh, an Apple and they're running some gross margin on their product, like something anywhere from 30 to 40%. And then you have Tesla who's making cars and he, they, and, and, and Elon is saying, you know, we're not sure if Tesla, I mean, our margins are going to bottom for, at Tesla and his, he posts an 18 point X amount of gross margin, auto gross margin. Um, it's kind of saying like, okay, like you want to be treated like a growth company at a high P, but we don't see it. And the thing about it is, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why people won't see it. It's because they refuse to, because they just don't like Elon, his perspective on the world, his political leanings. And he pays a price and so does all the shareholders. That's just the reality. Like when you sign up by buying shares in Tesla, you're kind of facing the facts that, yeah, this is this could be um, contentious with a large portion of the population. Like when a CEO is not keeping his head down, like you don't see anyone talking about um, the CEO of Apple uh, talking about uh, the latest presidential gaffe or something about, you know, um, people participating in other gender sports or what have you. Like it, this is this is strictly an Elon ism, basically. But the the, the positive side and, the, and, and whatever they might consider the negative side, what is, which I just consider just free speech, but comes the, the positive side is what he's doing. It's like, you know, let's say you are a progressive person and you're not really into the idea that, you know, Elon might assume the the leanings of a, of a, a conservative sometimes, um, though he claims to be a libertarian, which is ideally uh, what everyone should really be, just kind of not really libertarian, but really in the middle and, and, and choosing, uh, you know, multiple uh, issues when, when deciding who to vote for, for office. But anyways, the idea of a clean world a cleaner climate less pollution you know it's kind of resides in the area of of um more progressivism than let's say conservatism so it's weird how people kind of have to reconcile the fact that the person who uh elon musk who who made electric vehicles cool who is enabling the the clean energy transition with battery storage is somehow a bad dude but that's the that's the sentiment that they have to fight against, and and, and we as shareholders are you know, it's a roller coaster of a ride while they do that. Going on to the next key takeaway from Deep Water, Tesla is making investments at levels no other car maker can compete with, which is why traditional auto is in trouble. I and mean, this is this is really telling when uh, a person that goes on CNBC consistently is understanding the fact that legacy automotive is in for a rude awakening, and you can see that in the desperation of Volkswagen uh, cutting back on hours uh, for their EV vehicle workers, cutting back on models, firing the CEO of Audi, having that uh, all-hands managers meeting, which which seemed to be um, kind of the, this is their last hurrah. If they can't pull this off in the next two years, most likely the VW that you know will cease to exist. They have very uncompetitive products in all categories uh, and in all regions where they're, they're, they're losing market share in China to the Chinese and losing market share to China in Europe. And they really don't have much market share uh, necessarily in America, and especially when it comes uh, to trying to, to, to make an impact in the EV market. You know, I think it's the, re- the reality that, you know, 
that I spoke about recently and other people that uh, that that comment on, on, on Tesla is that people wanted Tesla EVs, not EVs. When people said they wanted EVs, they just wanted Teslas. Let's move on to the next key takeaway so we can just get through this. The number three, the biggest surprise, FST may be licensed by a major OEM. A significant potential for Tesla to expand its margins. We talked about this where this is essentially uh, software like margins or just 100% margin. Um, you know, there's going to be some type of like costs that come into uh, developing this um, FSD systems for the different cars that the, those OEM manufacturers have because the dimensions will be different. They'll have to um, somehow you know, share with them the specifications of these cameras, what type of mountings they're going to have, provide those to them, create the software with all these different specifications for it. And, uh, you know, at the same time, for, for the legacy OEM people, they have to share a lot of uh, design details for cars that are not out yet with their number one competitor in the EV market, which is going to be interesting. But if they can save costs by not having to develop their own software without having to develop their own autonomy software, not to have to develop any of the hardware associated with that, um, I think it could be a boon for them because they just want to essentially what you know Ford and GM want to do. They just want us to assemble cars. And I and a key, key word is assemble because that's what they're doing. Like they don't make every, they don't have a vertical integration of all the components of a, of a car that they make. Like they, they are farmed out to different suppliers, like literally thousands of suppliers for each car. Um, but but uh, if you want to take a look at Deep Water Management's um, uh, article about the the reaction to the uh, the earnings report, it's very good. It's uh, deepwatermgmt.com, uh, and they kind of talk about uh, the, the roadmap for margin, investing in the new business, so you can understand what that means when they're saying they're investing in new business. Key point is... They are ramping the production of the batteries and it's going, what, 80% quarter over quarter, licensing full self-driving software, et cetera. So let's move on to the next bit of news. And these happened to come out today um, while this, the stock was selling off in tremendous amounts. Many, many, many analysts have came out with uh, modifications of price targets and or upgrades uh, or downgrades uh, to, to Tesla stock. So um, this is all from Soren Merritt's Twitter. Wedbush has raised their Tesla price target to 350 from 300. They have a buy rating on Tesla. Uh, Sawyer goes on to say, JP Morgan, who really hates Elon, still confirmed and uh, still reaffirmed accelerating on Tesla. The price target is 120. Um, I think that is unchanged. I think 120 is unchanged, and it's they're just saying it's all the same. I think they raised the price target by five dollars like a month ago when Tesla was on its run up. Truist Securities has raised their Tesla price target to $254 from uh, $245. Zuho has uh, raised Tesla to $330, still keeps their buy rating. Deutsche Bank has raised Tesla's price target to $300 from $260 with a buy rating, and we remain bullish. And we know that uh, Deutsche Bank um, has kind of you know a close relation to the uh, Berlin factory. Uh, they really like what Tesla is doing and they're having a, kind of that inside understanding of how uh, advanced the, the company is when it comes to number one, creating vehicles, doing it efficiently, and number, number three, doing th doing something that no one else is doing, making EVs at a, a profit. So we always like to bag on Tesla for not having like a 30%, 40% gross margin like, you know, uh, another quote unquote tech company, but no one else in this industry is doing it with any type of Positive. I mean, the other people are, are literally negative hundreds of percent uh, underwater on each car they sell. And so, so let's before we dive into some um, charts. So the, the, there is a rebalancing. We talked about the rebalancing last week. Um, so the Nasdaq, or essentially the Nasdaq 100 index, which is uh, tracked by a lot of ETFs, be it like QQQ or otherwise, they're really tired of you know six or seven or eight large mega capitalization companies taking up basically like half of the weighting of their index because as the, as their prices have gone up all the other companies outside the top seven or eight have not gone up in the same amount and so they're very very top heavy and for them they just don't believe that's an accurate representation of the market that, that they're wanting to track uh so on this uh twitter image from uh, dana uh, Marlene, uh, this is going to be on the left column is the name of the company. The second column is going to be the current weighting as of uh, the 14th, 
which is now a week old, and anticipated future weighting is the percentage that it's going to be. So you can see the differential in uh, the third, uh, the fourth column basis point change. And uh, in this case, you're seeing that Tesla was 4.5% as of a week ago, but we do know Tesla has sold off since then tremendously. So just keep note of that. The anticipated future weighting is 3.4%. That's a basis change of one point, what about basically a percent. And that flow impact is around $3.3 billion. Now we can ask a question. When this information came out recently, does today's move price in this required selling of, of these stocks to get their weights down in the NASDAQ 100 and et cetera? All the ETFs that track the NASDAQ 100, if they're out there, will also have to do the same proportion amount of selling. Now, what's interesting is almost all of these names are very, very red today. So it's possible that where Tesla, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch to the charts now, where where Tesla couldn't find any buying momentum at all. And it, and it could be for the mere fact that, number one, there is a rebalancing going on. And number two, the reaction um, to the to the earnings where where there are where analysts and even people like maybe you and me um i think honestly though i think people who are fans of elon and tesla were pretty happy with the report happy with the beat in the eps happy uh, maintaining free cash flow happy with the rampant production and happy that the auto gross margin wasn't 17 percent which some people like who really analyze tesla's business be it like troy tesla like on twitter who had it at 17 and 17 and a half percent um, for their auto gross margin, 18 point something percent is a lot. It, it's convincing to the fact that they were able to, number one, beat on this EPS, ma like maintain an 18 percent, which is an inline um, uh, auto gross margin, while discounting some of their cars, uh, what, four, five, six, seven thousand dollars right off the top. And it's, it, and it's so it says a lot about how much more efficient cars are being made. And let's be serious, the the tool, the retooling of the lines hasn't even been done until the first week of this quarter. Um, so how, what are we gonna see at the end of this quarter? We might have a little less production number, which went on to affect the possibility that, you know, this quarter is gonna have less production than in the second quarter. Uh, some analysts and some people that are selling was citing that was one of their main reasons uh, for selling the stock. Um, as you can see in the chart, there's a big gap down and there is basically red hourly candles until the end of the day where it's barely a green candle. It really looks like, uh, I don't know, it looks like a falling star. It's, 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 it's a really, it's a really disappointing, uh, <laughs> price action and, and candles and pattern because when Tesla experiences sharp sell-offs, uh, you don't really see immediate rebounds necessarily. Now we did, before we go into a smaller time frame, uh, we can see that over here on the 15th of June and over here on the 22nd of June, there was some pretty sharp buying. Um, so I can't say it never happens, um, but this this is something else. This is like a Jackson Hole experience uh, where when a sharp sell-off happens, and maybe we can find one back in uh, September and August, when you see it like right here at the end of September, when it starts selling, it kind of just sell. So this was a sharp sell and then it gap down again, continued to sell. And even though, you know, there was a little bit of buying, it was, it came back, it came back up, swift, swift sell off, gap up, completely fill the gap and sell off even more, go up, then go down, go up, down, gap down and just sell off, sell off, sell off. So when you see like a one day sell off, like we really hope that you can have a day like this back in August where um, the sell-off was very sharp, quick rebound, and but you saw again it would continue to sell off. Now let's look at the price action um, for on a, the minute time frame, and you can see um, the diagonal here is uh, the I kept this as our only drawing. This is the downward trend line from uh, the highs and the three peaks uh, from over a year and a half ago. Uh, so we kind of breached it and and we. We, we tried to make a base on it on Wednesday uh, before earnings, and we kind of sold off as we de-risked into it. We tested that trend line again from the bottom. We rejected, 
and we gap down. So it's it's this is a story I was telling you guys about that. You know, when we go through the trend line, right? Uh, it sets us up. It will then, it, of course, it will sit on the trend line, which we anticipated that, and that gives the opportunity for the reaction to the earnings to kind of create the story that Tesla wasn't able to capture the downward trend line and bounce off of it. It basically peaked uh, right through, said hi, and immediately sold off in a very violent way. And, and that type of rejection, even when you see type of rejections on, on, on a smaller time frame or even intraday, the rejections have a lot of momentum to it. And it takes a while to really capture yourself, catch yourself and, and try to, to make a base and, and then go up. So it's gonna be really interesting what's gonna happen tomorrow um, you know, we know that there's still a lot of puts at 270 and a lot of puts at 260 were, were bought up yesterday and today. So like, where are we going to see the wall for the, the calls and the puts? Um, I think right now, as far as the call wall, meaning the upper, um, upper range, that's going to be defined by open interest on options and volume options purchase. You're probably looking at around 275 to 270 and the puts are around 270. So if I also highlight a real interesting area, um, it would be something like this. Uh, this area, like if you can maybe try to get a bounce. But we do know, number one, that we sold off into the after hours. We're in the 260s right now from the 262, uh, 91. So that's pretty sad. Um, so we're going to be already looking at a, a gap down open unless things recover in the futures for Tesla. And, uh, you know, I want to say that if the market makers don't want to pay out the 270s, you'll end up in this area. Um, the reality is we don't know who owns all these puts. So currently we're like this. So let's say we open up tomorrow and we do something like this. And the thing about this, this would diverge from the indices. Uh, this will diverge from the indices because where the indices are parked now, the S&P 500 especially, where it's parked right now, is actually a, a fine price when you consider um, the options uh, that are expiring tomorrow, which would be a big option expiry. It's the, the OPEX for the month, meaning where um, majority of options are going to be expiring, be it single ticker, or more importantly, the S&P, I'm sorry, the SPX, um, and of course, all the other ETFs. So if we go up that much to get into that area where they don't pay out the 270s, if we're measuring them from the 260s, uh, let's say to 272 or 27199, basically they, they wouldn't want to pay out call at 272.50. That would be a 4.9 percent move. Four, sorry, 4.29 percent move or 11 dollars a share. So that would be that would be a tall order for Tesla unless there's some type of momentum. We talked about the rebalancing. If the rebalancing happened today in the minds of traders, meaning they sold off these stocks in preparation for the reweighting and rebalancing of the those affected shares after hours on Friday tomorrow, um, then the move can make sense where the, it can go up a couple percent. But can it really go up four percent to get over two seventy? Maybe maybe not. That's that's a lot because if the if the index doesn't move because of how the options are expiring, um, because it's in a sweet spot between a put wall and a call wall, uh, SPX that is that it'd be hard um, if there's no index buying for Tesla to also uh, kind of outperform by a factor of 4%, essentially. We'd like to see it because I think a little bit of a relief would be good for some people. And if you get this move, if you get this move, which is a 4% move, this is where you kind of want to be thinking about um, selling a call or something. This is not financial advice because who knows what's going to happen. Um, but it would, it would be nice to be able to start collecting some premium again um, before the weekend because I like holding calls sold over the weekend uh, because I'm, I'm trying to get Theta to work for me. It's two days on the calendar plus um, the night and the morning before the market opens on Monday. So I'm really hoping we can get a nice bounce. Um, am, I, am I optimistic for it? Not necessarily. Uh, we are dangerously about to pay off a lot of $260 puts on Tesla. Um, so I really want to see us get into the green. Now, as you're noticing on the minute chart, there was, if you were to look at areas of interest, which are maybe you can even say are some gaps, um, that on a bullish Tesla, 
they would Tesla would use gaps as a way to uh, find a base and not actually fill. Um, but as you saw here, we gapped down big. We filled one gap here. And that was where, ironically, where we opened. Um, so the gaps kind of do matter because if you if you see how this is working, you know these gaps are just areas of interest, really. Um, so we opened just below the gap, and we sold down to the gap fill at the 270, and we kind of tried to create a base there, and, get, and it got bought up a little bit, um, and it was and this area is, is very pivotal anyway. So anywhere from the, the 270 to the 275, this, there was a lot of interest over the last couple of days. So it kind of makes sense. It would try to form a base there, but it's quickly sold off. And it then went on to fill um, this other gap. So it completed this gap. This was from deliveries. And the delivery gap is now completely full. And it went on to, um, in my mind, everyone was thinking that it would actually fill all the gaps down to 257. So this is something to be watching for. If you see some selling pressure, um, you probably want to see a support in the near term and, and until you get to the gap close. And after that, it's going to be all about the 241-ish area to 235 area uh, for another gap fill. So it's obviously paying attention to these gaps. It's using them as a way to either to, to find support or bounce from um, bounce down from them. But yeah, so things are not looking too great after hours in the futures for Tesla. Um, this type of this type of pattern, like when you see this this type of selling and there's just really no interest in buying, like this is this is where you kind of be wanting to, if you're trading Tesla, to understand that this is a sell all day type of event. This is not one where you want to necessarily be buying the dip, especially if you're day trading. This is something you just kind of want to have your puts and this and use the one day to expiration advantage and the volatility of those puts and the cheapness of them comparatively to buying them let's say earlier on in the week uh to your benefit somehow some way and, and if you were like me and you sold calls against your shares and and you saw some nice uh you know some profit from them um i know that unless you sold a very very expensive call you wouldn't be able to use the hedge your 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 holdings as much as maybe you like to. Um, in this scenario, I sold a call that netted a premium around six hundred forty dollars. Um, I closed it. Uh, it was worth, I want to say ninety something dollars. So the profit there was around five hundred and forty five hundred fifty dollars in profit. I had a put that was at the two seventy seven strike. I closed that pretty early at this base right here, um, and due to the the volatility crush. I made a couple hundred bucks off it, but it did not compensate for every 100 shares, uh, every 100 batch of shares. Um, that was essentially uh, uh, $2,836 in, in, in value loss today. So you would have to have considerable amounts of puts. I know I had uh, a put that was a 250 um, strike point. I saw that actually become something that was worth like one cent and became worth, uh, I want to say, 27 cents or something like that. I don't remember exactly. Um, I closed those too, but you know they're not they weren't effective hedges because the, the the volatility crush made them basically kind of worthless at the beginning of the day, and even with the gap down, and and as the day went on, they started slowly gaining in value. I, I entered more puts around here around the 271 points. I realized you know it's it's just not going to make a new high, and and you never saw any highs taken out, meaning it didn't. You know, make a considerable high. Uh, it didn't like, for example, this one didn't uh, get higher than the the two hundred seventy four sixty price, and and that's kind of that's kind of telling. Like that when you see how, and I'll zoom in so you can guys can see it maybe a little bit better. So I was, you would look at something like this. So you see that this is a high, and it doesn't get close to it horizontally, and actually sells off really quickly. And it's just basically just looks like a, a bear flag and it breaks down um, and it didn't really stop. That's kind of the flag shape. So you would have, maybe this is better. So this is the horizontal on the flag. This is a slight, like almost like descending triangle type of shape. Um, when it fell through that horizontal line, it tried to come up and test it from underneath. And that's what I mean when it sells off and bounces from um, support downwards. 
Let's take a look at another reason why uh, this type of price action is happening with Tesla and also with uh, other tech stocks, say, be it Nvidia, Meta, and Microsoft. And let's take a look at this chart. This is the daily chart for uh, the, the Dow ETF, which is DIA as a ticker. And as you see here, Dow has actually have many has many green candles in a row. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the Dow has been green nine days in a row, which is very, very rare. Um, and you know, I understand we're still the Dow is not at an all time high, but it is at a yearly high. And this kind of consolidation that's been happening since, well, let's see here. I would say around the twenty first. I'm sorry, the 15th of April, 2021. This is a very long kind of rangy wick off pattern. This is 818 days. So if if the Dow goes up another 5.5%, it will literally make an all-time high. And what is supporting that is a Dow Industrial Index, is, is I'm sorry, Dow Transportation Index is doing, doing really, really well. Um, so... That's kind of driving the Dow forward. I'm um, having. I know that the like this those telecommunication stocks that sold off really hard. Um, I think it was earlier this week, but got bought up uh, really nicely along with uh, healthcare and 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 and, um, and finance. A lot of banks reported this week and last week, and they had relatively healthy earnings. But if you're looking at the Dow, the Dow has a lot more interest. You know, the Dow has been a laggard. Uh, it has not performed very well when all of the QQQ likes and the S&P 500 was really taking off. You can see how it didn't really break out of a horizontal uh, kind of uh, ranging or consolidation that it's been doing since last year, October, September of last year. And it finally broke out. So you can look at the performance of your stock like Tesla or other tech stock and say to yourself, like, is this the correction or is this the top? Are we at the top? I would argue that it's not it's not that at all. What we're dealing with is a uh, a rotation to to make uh, the overall breadth of the market much more healthy looking instead of just Apple, Microsoft, Meta, you know, charging the way for every single index that they're in. Um, we're seeing the Dow get bought up really really nicely. Now you could even see that you know this is like you can say this is very much like a wick off and this is uh, crossing the creek and going up. Uh, this is the spring and it, it, it looks really good it's just a, such a long time frame you have to be so patient with it you weren't seeing much movement out of it it was not rewarding at all but now are you breaking out probably so i would say you, you, you definitely probably so so i would say you even broke out of a trend line um sorry about that if we do, do, draw, draw the try trend line just a little bit diagonal based off these peaks and you can see it consolidated and finally broke out now let's look at the, the NASDAQ uh, index, the QQQ, overlaid and compared with XLF in orange. This is the uh, the finance ETF, which has things like uh, big banks, uh, credit card companies, and some insurance companies like Berkshire Hathaway makes up a large portion of the XLF. It's a weird, it's a weird hodgepodge of, 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 of companies. It's not all like banks, which is like some people think it might be. Um, but yeah, and here is the, um, in, in light blue is XLV, which is healthcare, um, biggest components, kind of like United Health, and it has uh, the pharmacies and might have some like uh, pharmaceutical, big, big pharmaceutical companies. And it's overlaid onto the QQQ and looking at the QQQ, you know, they were kind of trading together since, um, since the beginning of last year. Uh, well, this is the summer last year. So the summer last year, they're kind of following each other relatively closely. And it wasn't really a remarkable outperformance until uh, we had that August run last year. And in finance and in healthcare wasn't as strong comparatively so. And you notice back in spring when all the, the banking issues kind of reared their head from the regional banking system, everyone ran to the QQQ um, or the NASDAQ to buy names like Apple and Microsoft as a safety haven. If you need to stay long, I'd rather stay long in those names than in a regional bank or even the big banks like JP Morgan. Um, they kind of have suffered a little bit and have ranged for a while. And you can see that 
in these in these charts where they were not convincingly making highs. Um, they're actually making lower lows through the spring. Early into the summer, they kind of started seeing an uptrend. And as you can see here, they've actually been relatively strong over the past couple hours, couple trading hours, compared to that of the, the NASDAQ. Um, on a longer time frame, uh, the, the XLF has been on a nice uptrend, and maybe it's now time for the XLV or healthcare companies to kind of close this uh, kind of deviation, this gap, or some people call it like kind of like a JAWS, where you're tracking two different tickers or two different types of things, and they traded with some type of correlation, and one broke out, and others or one other uh, stayed kind of flat or down. And the idea is like if they've been tracking each other relatively closely, eventually they will return to the, the to the mean, and either that these two sectors will catch up to the to the Nasdaq, or the Nasdaq will help them catch up by selling off a little bit. Um, we'll, you really have to be careful when it comes into the close tomorrow. Like if the rebalancing wasn't priced in enough, like you kind of want to have a hedge there for the Nasdaq, um, be it some type of, you know, selling calls against your shares not financial advice. Please do your own research and be aware that you can lose your shares. And the other thing is, uh, you know, I know it's not the greatest thing, but, you know, shorting, shorting the, the QQQ, um, some people can short it by just naked shorting. Be careful there because you can get burned really, really quickly because you're going to be essentially, you know, taking a loan out to get some shares, selling those shares. And then if the, if the pricing runs away from you, you have to make up the difference if you want to get out of that trade. Um, whereas the thing like buying a put against the QQQ uh, will have a th large theta loss over the next three days of the weekend. Um, so maybe not a necessary ideal. Selling options is always going to be a little bit better, a little bit safer. And another thing you can do is inverse by inverse share. So hold over the weekend. Um, and this is kind of where margin really comes into play. I don't recommend anyone really fucking around with margin too much. But if you have, let's say, you have a portfolio and you have all your shares for your retirement or something in there, and you notice that you know your broker gives you margin, um, so something that I would advocate for is when, when you're utilizing margin, um, number one, there's two scenarios where you want to maybe do it. When you have a high conviction about something and it's a short-term trade, something that you can just get out of very quickly and understand that you don't want to go double long on something because it is you're already you're leveraging yourself um, with no ability to hedge. So you, you, you have to have conviction or it has to be some type of you know smartly hedged short-term trade. Um, the other thing which you you can use margin for is is a perfect use of margin is uh, holiday weekends weekends where you're trying to protect your shares against any type of news, um, some volatility. There's a lot of inverse shares that are out there that can give you protection. They have inverse finance, they have inverse real estate, they have inverse tech, they have inverse S and P 500. So let's say you're very tech heavy focused. SQQ is a leveraged inverse um, play against the Nasdaq. And so that allows you to use less capital um, to hedge a greater amount of your holdings. Uh, so whenever you think about, you know, trying to hedge overnight or over the weekend, you know, if you hedge in the right way, you can keep yourself from losing any money from any big changes um, that happen outside of the regular trading hours. And the worst case scenario is in the short term holding of a of a hedge like a inverse share is that the worst case scenario is you just don't get any gains. That should be your worst case scenario. Maybe you don't want to hedge 100%. Maybe you want to hedge 50 or 25%. Um, if, you, if you're if you coming into a situation, you don't know what's going to happen and you rather just you know protect yourself a little bit, have you know actively manage your money a little bit against uh, what could be a large sell-off after a very large run over the past couple, couple months, especially in the NASDAQ. So let's go back to Tesla to close things out. You know, it's really unfortunate that Tesla sold off so much. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why. We know that it's the reaction to perhaps the unknown quantity of what is the future gross margin, auto gross margin for, for their vehicles. We know it's the possible rebalancing of the um, of the NASDAQ, which Tesla sits at around 4.5% as of a week ago. I like to think that after selling off 10%, um, 
that it is maybe not weighted as much uh, due to the loss of market cap. And it could also be a rotation out of tech into laggard sectors like the finance sector and the healthcare sector, XLF, XLV. I was actually long into today um, with XLF and XLV, and it worked out very, very well as a way to, I was trying to find ways to hedge Tesla without being forced to deal with the implied volatility of it. So I was thinking to myself, okay, I can just long the banks because they've been down for a while and long healthcare because it was down for a while and it worked out very, very well. Um, and I have some runners on them uh, for next week, uh, but I don't think that trade will always be the trade. What other sectors um, might be lacking? That's something for you to try and check out um, to see if that kind of suits your play style. Just be careful that you know if you're trying to hedge Tesla with any other type of sector, ETF or shares or something like that, it's if it's not one for one, the hedge might not be effective and you can lose both ways. So just be, just be really careful about that. Um, but energy is really, really not participating. Uh, this year, just like healthcare and finance, we're in the same boat. Um, utilities uh, has been down or sideways for a very long time. You know, utilities just, they don't have any growth, and they're relying on on money. They don't they're they're not a really cash heavy business as far as like cash reserves. So they are subject to rates severely. And until we get some clarity on interest rates, uh, maybe utilities wouldn't be necessarily the best boat to be in. But they have been lagging behind. Uh, compared to uh, a lot, uh, compared to the S&P 500 or or the Nasdaq, so something to take a look at. Oh, by the way, we have some big things happening next week. We had the Federal Reserve meeting. Um, the VIX, I can just show you the VIX real quick. The VIX is still very very suppressed, and it is now once again still trading under 14 um, on the VIX. It it means that hedging is really really cheap. So. You know, when you're coming into events that don't have event theta, I mean, event volatility like Tesla's earnings. But if you just if you just take a look at the options chain and look at puts and how how cheap they are and how cheap VIX calls are, as you get into next week where you have earnings like Microsoft or Google or or Meta, along with uh, the interest rate hike from the Federal Reserve, it always doesn't react very well to those days. It usually sells off. The rebalancing of the Nasdaq coming this um, close after the close on Friday. Um, yeah, like there, there's a lot of stuff going on where it's ironic that volatility is so crushed. Like you think on a day like this where volatility, I mean, volatility would be at the 15, 16, 20 on the, on the VIX. But then you realize that what happened was more of a rotation into laggard industry, um, the Dow especially. Um, maybe the next is going to be the Russell 2000. Maybe the Russell 2000 kind of makes up ground. That's a possibility as well. Take a look at that with your free time and chart that out. Um, just know that regional banks were holding back the IWM or the Russell 2000 for a very long time. And their earnings are actually looking decent. They're not amazing, but they're not as dire as we would have thought they were. So once again, guys, thanks so much for listening. And uh, I'll have another video uh, out for you tomorrow. Have a good night. Bye.